Dr. Hammer, the originator of the technique called re-engineering, said, and I quote, bureaucracy is the chokehold of change. No matter what country, what organization, bureaucracy strangles creativity. It's the last to change and the first thing we should get rid of. Policies are hard to change, but yet we know we have to change. So we come up with new vision, now initiatives, go this way. But yet the educational policies and practices continue the same. We shoot ourselves in the foot rather than excel. Insufficient investment in education. This is something my country is grossly responsible for, and I think it's a problem here as well. You can't grow excellence in one year or two. You have to have a commitment to the medium to long term. Can you look your child in the eye and say, well, when you're in fourth grade, I'm going to give you an outstanding experience. But then after that, you go back to the old way because we don't see it's a priority. There are some things we should sacrifice for the future. We should invest strongly and continuously in education, regardless of who is a teacher, an administrator, a dean, or regardless of what party is in power. We can't have things zigzagging because we're looking at the future of the nation. Lack of critical thinking. Your neighbors have the same problem. If learning is defined as how much can you memorize, then don't ask your people to create new products. Ask them to copy. In the region, you have countries that have recognized they have not done well here. Singapore, Japan, China, Malaysia, Korea, South Korea, we can go on down the list. All of them in the last five to ten years have begun to institute training of their children in the area of creativity, problem solving, and innovation. Why? Because it is not pervasive in the culture. Risk taking is not encouraged. Obedience is. Education not matching business needs. If you graduate, but if you don't have the skill sets to get a job, at the individual level we can say, tough luck. But if this is a national phenomena, we have a problem. If you want to be a regional hub for anything, you have to be able to look at what skill sets are required and program them in over time. For example, Medical tourism is something you want to get into. My question is, how good are you? How well qualified are your doctors, your hospitals? I used to be an advisor to the national hospital system in the state of Qatar in the Middle East. I trained probably 800 people throughout, doctors and, and others. But in looking at that hospital system, they said, we want to be able to meet the Joint International Commission standards, certified. But the same thing is, you have to have trust and quality in your doctors. If I need an operation, when I look up from a table before I get operated on, I don't care if they're Thai or American. I want to know, how often have you done this operation before? Because we know practice makes perfect. The more you do it, the better my chance to survive. I don't care if you got an A because you memorized cardiology. I want to know how good of a cardiologist. Rote learning, we've already addressed it. Moving from telling to coaching. A teacher should be a facilitator, a resource guy, not someone you walk around and record. Henry Kissinger was guilty of this at Harvard. 
Henry Kissinger used to teach international diplomacy. And quite often, Kissinger would fly off to one part of the world or another. And one day, he decided he didn't want to go to a lecture. He was at Harvard, but he decided, well, I'm too tired, I don't want to go. So he had his graduate assistant go into the lecture with a tape recorder, push the button, and here was Henry on tape. He was very insulted to find that all his graduate students plugged it in so one could record the other machine. There were no students in the class. This is not education, this is not learning. Lastly, weak English language, we've heard, is language the magic bullet? No. Mentality is. Are you open to change? Are you willing to think? Are you willing to be creative? If you aren't, if you have facility in English or Chinese or Japanese, it's irrelevant. Language is only a platform to access the interstate. Now, where do we want to go? The target, ultimately, is world class. Globalization, that's what we're talking about. Well, think global, act local. This is the mantra. What do we find? This is uh, uh, Akucha is an international correspondent for Reuters. She writes in New York Times, International Herald Tribune. And based on her research, while well, Taiwan, Singapore, China, and India have poured billions into developing world-class university education, English language, and high-value skills, quote, Thailand has moved little beyond a decade-old system aimed mostly at preserving Thainess, national identity. That's quite an indictment of your system. If you want to compete on the world stage and you only look inside instead of out, you are automatically non-competitive. There's a model developed by Brunswick. It's called the lens model. It's a nice way to say, look at things through the eyes of others. Because sometimes when we look at it through our own eyes, we don't see things. Last night, in preparation for this presentation, I wanted to look at this presentation through the eyes of an extremely well-qualified Thai. So I invited my wife, Luck, for a minute to be my audience, and I went through the entire presentation. And she pointed out to me where it was strong and where it needed improvement, where I should refine it and where it was okay. That's the lens model in application. Now, this is a gentleman who did research and is working at the World Bank. Thai universities offer narrow fields of study, making it difficult for students to adapt to the global economy. This isn't a correspondent. This is someone from the World Bank looking at it. What does that say? It says that if you're going to study medicine, you go straight into medicine. If you're going to study economics, you go straight into economics. Unlike in the United States, if I want to study, my first degree had three majors and four minors. My majors were education, history, and social science. My minors were biblical archaeology, art criticism, political science, and business administration. When you take an American bachelor's degree, the first two years is what we call a distribution. You have to take courses in science, English, math, and other areas. Why? Because we want you to be a well-educated, -edu broad citizen, not narrowly tracked. That is what they're talking about. And this is not just unique to Thailand, but it's pervasive throughout the region. So it's an indictment of the region. It's not Thailand by itself. Now, Hariri is a futurist. He's a professor at the University of San Francisco. And he had a very nice comment that looked at how change is different from one period to another. He said, what was good enough for yesterday is not good enough for today. What's good enough for today will certainly not be good enough for tomorrow. Why? 
because the criteria to assess excellence are different. The context, the environment, the time changes. So if I do exactly what worked 40 years ago and led to excellence, the precise same thing today is out of frame. It doesn't fit. Some things are helpful, many are not. When we look at change, we have to look at targets. Well, let's look at targets within Thailand. This first box here looks at one university to another, one school to another within the country. And the challenge here is, which is the best? Being in the hallowed halls of Chula, you have performed very well in this competition. Now, being the best in the country does not mean you're the best in the region. Does not mean you're the best in the world. But now look at what you see in the paper, in educational journals. When you look at Thailand, what does it say? You're playing the game of catch up. You're behind the ball. So what are you trying to do? We gotta get ready. For what? ASEAN 2015. My question is, you should have done that 10, 12 years ago. It's almost too late. And when you're getting ready for ASEAN, your competition is getting ready for the next step, globalization. So if you go incrementally, nit noi, step by step, you're behind. You got to make a quantum leap and start focusing now on world class. If you don't, you're in trouble. Some issues in regionalization and globalization. This one I think I added one or two days ago. One, quality of education. Two, mentality. Are you open to change? Three, cultural imperatives. How do cultural values either facilitate change and improvement or hold you back? They're either an enabler or a disabler. Four, willingness to change. It's one thing to know you should change. The other thing is, are you ready to accept it? Until you have the acceptance of the need for change, nothing happens. Language skill. Do you have them? Which ones do you need? Continuity of vision. One thing that has made China better economically today is they had a vision 20 years ago about economic capitalism that was controlled. It has been implemented continuously regardless of who is sitting in the chair. This is what we're talking about. We'll get back to vision in a few minutes. Leadership. How good are your leaders? I'm not just talking of politics, administration in universities, or principals in high schools. I'm talking of how do you grow leaders from the ground up? If you look at an example, we have an exchange program between Satichula and Upper St. Clair High School in Pittsburgh. Uh, Dr. Prutt was the one who came up with the vision for that program. Uh, Ajahn Luck is the one that designed and is directing that program. Now, what does it say? Our high school, our elementary school, has a leadership academy in the summer. And we enroll students in leadership training from the grade of one and two. Leaders are not just born, they are made. So when we talk of leadership, just don't look at the top, look at the bottom. Because these are the people who will take over when all of us have retired. Talent management. It's one thing to know where your gaps are, it's another thing to fill them. It's another thing to keep the talent after you develop it. If you look at the developing world, the most mobile person is someone from your country with a PhD. 
because with that, it is their ticket to wherever they want to go. A medical degree is another case. They can go anywhere in the world. They're not tied to Thailand. A less mobile degree is a bachelor's, maybe even a master's. But if you have a PhD, like your ticket, you can make decisions. My question is, what do you put in place enthusiastic to help feed and develop the next generation instead of be beaten down by bureaucracy and archaic rules that don't fit your current needs and your future direction? Now, with that in place, let's look at time. If you look at transformation, we go back before 1997 with the financial collapse in Asia. An average transformation in a company or a country was minimum 10 years. Now, since 1997, one thing has really hit and has been put into practice. And the answer is sense of urgency. Think of this as a learning curve, okay? Think of this as my learning curve. This is a pencil. When I take this and I push it back, what happens to my learning curve? It shoots up. Now the question is, if I shorten time from 10, the average time today for transformation is two and a half to three years in a company or in a nation. Now, as soon as I push it back, I have to ask the question, does my teaching methodology remain the same when it's slow, step by step, compared to when it has to be rapid? If I don't train, change my methodology, I cannot achieve my new target. So my question is, what are you doing to train your teachers? And we find reports. When you needed more teachers, you hired a whole bunch, but they weren't prepared very well. Asian. Now you have a choice. Choose the win, choose the lose. Now, what are you facing? You're facing the game we call a paradigm shift. How many of you play the game of checkers? Could you raise your hand? Simple child's game, checkers. Okay, now, if I move from the game of checkers to the game of chess, What's similar? What's the same? Checkers and chess. The board's the same. Second, the number of pieces on the board is the same. But the problem is, the rules of how to win are different. When my son was three and a half, I taught him checkers. Why? I wanted him to start learning strategy. Well, after, I'd inst usually you'd say, you know, do this, this is the rule, do this, this is the rule. Sometimes you have to do shock and awe. I did this with my son, frustrated him to death sometimes. So at three and a half, I said, Don, let's play a game. So we sat down and played checkers, but I did the rules. Guess who won? I did. I knew the rules. He had the foggiest idea. And my son is used to winning. He's a perfectionist. He's quite an intelligent little boy. So he got so upset. Oh, he was angry. Tears came down. Oh, you cheated me. Okay, I said, Don, calm down. Do you want to cry or do you want to win? I want to win. Let me replay the game and I'll show you every single move I made and why. I'll show you my strategy. Why did I do this when you did this? Since that day, I have never won a game of checkers against that kid. Because he saw it through my eyes and he understood how to play the game, the paradigm. So he was getting kind of overconfident about the age of five. I thought, well, let's up the stakes. So I was in uh, Czechoslovakia and I came across one night I was walking the streets in Prague and I found a chess set, bohemian glass, hand blown, beautiful. So I bought it, heavier than anything. 
put it in my suitcase, brought it home. And I said, Don, we have a new game. Let's play chess. Again, same technique. He played chess like checkers. Again, frustration, tears, anger. And then I stood him back again and I said, here, you gotta be careful. If it looks the same, it may not be the same. So let's look at the change. How is it different? These are the rules. Here are the moves. Here's what I did, one by one by one. And we were fortunate that a former grandmaster was the uncle of one of his classmates in the elementary school. And his uncle visited for three weeks, stayed with the family. So his uncle gave chess lessons, created a chess club and was teaching these little kids in elementary school, play the game of chess. After Don learned my technique, how I play, plus had the grandmaster teaching him, the best I can do after four hours is a draw. I've never won a game. My son is now 23. So, paradigm shift is critical. We have to know not just where we are, but where we're going. If what worked for education in Thailand yesterday, if you take that full force and carry it forward and say it's gonna work tomorrow when we want to be global, I'm sorry. It's the difference between checkers and chess. The paradigm has shifted. The evaluators have changed. You're probably going to. Some things will propel you. Diligence, hard work, focus, but others will not. If we look at changing paradigms, this list is the old, this list is the new. We don't have to go through it, but it's something for you to refer to in your time. But you can see, this was when things were predictable, slow, stable. Here, things are dynamic. Change before was a choice, do it or not. Today, change is an imperative. With that, we can look at the work of Edward Deming. And he's a good choice because he's seen as one of the pioneers in quality management. Deming worked at Bell Labs and developed statistical techniques that he published in a book in 1954, Quality Statistical Measurement. The curious thing is he's American, Bell Labs is in New Jersey. But at the time, Americans ignored him. Companies said he was crazy. But a graduate student who worked with Deming from Japan said, hey, this makes sense. And he invited him to Japan. For the next 25 years, Deming implemented his ideas on quality management in Japan. And Japan started manufacturing quality vehicles and other products, and they took our lunch. So just because you're great as a tie doesn't mean the people sitting next to you are going to listen. If they don't, look at the impact. So according to Demon, it's not enough to do your best. You can say, I try hard. You must know what to do, then do your best. It's a big difference. This is by Pearl S. Buck. Again, we can do that in your time. Lack of scientists. This is one thing that was pointed out. And this comes from the National Research Council of Thailand. Your own research. What did it say? It said, if I look per capita, 10,000 people drawn randomly, on average, how many scientists do you have? Well, 1.27. This is about, is about one person and about half a smirk. Okay? South Korea has 20 scientists per 10,000, same as Taiwan. Japan has 100, same as the US. Now, if sustainable growth and development is based upon the STEM areas, 
science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And if you're behind the curve on how many scientists you have, how many companies or countries are going to be happy to come to Thailand and invest? They're going to have you make a little part that's going to, they're going to go somewhere else because the Thais aren't ready. Creative destruction. It's a great idea from change. Creative destruction is the idea that what you do that you think adds value suddenly is meaningless because your competition has gone the next step. Okay, creative destruction. What is that when we talk of education? Well, when you had no formal way of learning, memorization was a good way to do it. In the Middle East, what is education? Memorizing the Quran. So memorization became one of the ways of learning. But memorization does not mean creativity. Problem solving, problem anticipation. So what we have to look at is, how does this make what you do have no value? Scholarships. 2003, your government budgeted 8.2 billion baht to provide, I quote, 1,500 scholarships over five years to send your students overseas. At that time, Thailand had doubled the population of Malaysia, yet consistently over time, the country of Malaysia, through a department called JPA, translate that here into the Civil Service Commission of Thailand. Malaysia has been sending 1,400 a year. And this goes on for decades. The National Oil Company, I've been a consultant in Malaysia for years, Petronas. Petronas sends 300 a year, going back 20 years. National Telephone Company, PT Telcom, 300 a year. And it's cumulative over time. How much is 1,500 spit in the ocean? Little or no impact. Literacy college and development. Literacy, you've done well. As of 2010, 94% of your people could read and write. That's good. I wish we could say that in the United States. But 70% of your people finish high school. That's not bad. Problem is, only 18% finish college or university. I'll compare it to a state in the United States, the state of South Carolina. State of South Carolina is the second poorest in the United States. The, the percent of university and college graduates is 34%. And during the period from 2008 until now, South Carolina has been one of the states with the highest unemployment rate. Why? because people didn't have the level of education required to attract companies with level skills. Let's look at change. Start out with the idea of a learning organization. What is it? Why is it important? A learning organization is one which feeds on itself. A learning organization looks at three things. One, transparency. What is it? Transparency says I should know everything I need to know to do my job well. It shouldn't be hidden, not secret. In short, the rules of the game should be right up front so anybody can see them. Two, sustainability. If change is to happen, we have to continuously build on it. If I change to the right today and to the left tomorrow, no change happens. If you want a good example, look at the United States and what's happening between the president and Congress. The president is one party. He wants to go this way. The Republicans would like to unseat him in the next election. They're going this way. And what do you have? A bunch of constipated people in Washington and a frustrated country. No changes happen because we're going in two different directions. If this happens in Thailand in the field of education, you fail. 
It makes no difference what color shirt you're wearing. The key is the future of the country and the future of your children and their children. This has no politics. In the United States, I'm apolitical. I'm a registered independent. I don't care if they're Republican or Democrat. I go on the quality of the person and the quality of the ideas. And if they have a history of implementation. So looking at Thailand, I'd apply the same standard. The critical thing is, sustainability is key. What is the ultimate target? Institution building. At the national level, you call it nation building. Institution building says, make the organization, make the country stronger tomorrow than it is today. And you cannot do that if the quality of your education is substandard. It won't happen. Now, let's link that with performance. Here we have a curve for performance-based organization. If this is uh, Japan Incorporated, or if this is a public company, or a government-owned organization within Thailand. Performance-driven has one benefit and a severe disadvantage. The benefit is through intimidation, encouragement, uh, or a variety of other techniques, I can push you to achieve. The problem is, after you achieve, you fall. You burn out, unless we add a learning base. The learning base is, if you're working in a company, we call this training and development, talent management. We have to be able to add new skills, increase proficiency, how well you do things. Because if we don't, what happens? Your performance is not sustainable. Performance is like a roller coaster. Nobody is going to invest in Thailand if performance is like this. Well, you know, if you were here in 2009, boy, they really did good in Thailand.